Hi, everybody. How are you? Good. Okay. This is my first time uh, speaking with this microphone. And uh, it is uh, very uncomfortable. I didn't realize that until right now. I feel like Britney Spears. But uh, <laughs> let's do it. I know we are here to talk about being bold and brave. I'd like to acknowledge something right off the bat. As a comedian, I am at the low end of the spectrum of brave, okay? <laughs> I understand brave people are soldiers, firefighters, police, people battling terminal illness. Comedians are here, okay? <laughs> K-pop dance groups around here. Okay, so I know where I am on the spectrum. I'm not trying to say I'm this incredibly brave person. I like telling jokes, it's fun. I, would, uh, I was telling my mom that I was going to do a, a TED talk, and uh, she's like, is it going to be weird to stand in front of people and not make them laugh? And I said, Mom, you must have forgot about the beginning of my career. Uh, <laughs> there was a lot of TED talks going on then, <laughs> and bars all over New York City. So we've come a long way to go full circle. I want to talk a little bit about the shift in culture uh, what's going on right now with maybe political correctness and how that's affected my industry and how you can possibly be bold and brave in that regard. Times have changed. We've got a lot more sensitive. Can you guys feel it? Yes. Okay. Now, not only sensitive, we've gotten a lot more entitled to our feelings. If we feel something, it's important we let everybody know. Okay? Now, why did this happen? Does anybody have kids here? Yes, a couple people? No? One, two, three, four. Now everybody has kids. Okay. Uh, a <laughs> second ago, barren. Now everybody has a whole troop. So, you guys fucked it up. You guys fucked it up with the kids. Okay? Your parenting sucks, and I'll explain why. All right? When I was growing up and I got in trouble in school, which was a lot, I would come home and I'd tell my parents, Mom, Dad, the teacher doesn't like me. Okay? And my mom and dad would say, who gives a fuck? In life, people are not gonna like you. Figure it out. Now, you guys, when you have kids in elementary school, they come home, they go, the teacher doesn't like me. And you go, well, let's get the teacher fired because <laughs> my kid's perfect. And everybody likes my kid. So you instill in his brain or her brain that the world should bend to them. And now I'm doing comedy and I tell a joke about something and someone stands up and they go, I don't like that. Well, why not? Because I don't. Well, everyone else is laughing, but that doesn't matter because in this moment, I don't like it. So now you have to leave. You get kicked out of my show. I had an instance recently, a girl had a seizure at my show. That's how funny I am. <laughs> now, uh, talk about killing. Anyway, so uh, she had a seizure at the show. We checked on her. She was fine. She leaves. Everything's good. So I started to make fun of what happened in the situation, and a girl in the crowd stood up. She's like, you can't make jokes about that. That's not funny. And I asked what she did for a living. She said she was an EMT. And I was like, why didn't you help? And you know why she didn't help is because this is what we do now. We complain, but we don't help because we think that's enough. Anyway, so here we lie in this situation where there's certain topics that people say you cannot joke about. They're taboo. Cannot joke about uh, violence, sexism, rape, incest. These topics you cannot make any content about whatsoever until Game of Thrones comes on. You know, then uh, <laughs> you can make a whole show about it for eight seasons. It's only literally about those topics. But after that, you can't, you know, not anybody else. You can, or unless you're president, you know. So all I'm saying is I want the moral obligations of the president. Is that that much to ask? I don't think that that's too much to ask of a comedian, right? But unfortunately for me, we live in an environment where people want to be very critical of what you say. So how do you be bold and brave in that environment? Here is my journey. Uh, I had a lot of success early on in television, but not necessarily stand-up comedy. I wanted to do stand-up, but the stand-up industry, for whatever reason, would never let me in. So I had to find a way 
around this blockade or whatever it was. I sat there and I go, okay, you know what I'll do? I come from two hardworking parents. They would do it themselves. I'm going to do it myself. So we go out, we film this special, we shoot at four different comedy clubs in New York City. We get the cab rides in between and we really dive into what a night of comedy is for a New York comic, okay? We put it together, we cook it up, we pitch it to everybody. Everybody said no. Lowest point in my whole career. But it was actually the most invaluable time in my entire life because I learned a couple things. One, adversity introduces a man to himself. Uh, that's an old phrase. I'm sure if they said it now, it would be adversity introduces a non-binary person to themselves or whatever. <laughs> uh, forgive Abraham Lincoln. It was a different time. He was progressive for his time, of course. Though. So we pitch it to everybody. Everybody says no. Everybody says no. Now what do I do? Okay, the doors are closed for everything. I have to figure out this business. Uh, something I learned in life is from nothing comes everything. And again, you learn these things later in life. You know, sometimes the lessons that happen in the moment, they don't hit you to months, years after. So I started kind of looking at the business and figuring out if I could hack it in some way. You know, I've always felt like my competitive advantage in whatever I do is problem solving. So how do I solve this problem? And... I think you can learn everything about whatever business you're in by asking people who are not in that business. Oftentimes, we're too close to understand the problems that we all have, okay? So I asked my friends that watch stand-up what they were watching and how they liked it. And they would all tell me about the things they were watching, and then they would all say the same thing. Every single one would be like, yeah, I watched it. It was funny, but I didn't finish it. I go, yeah, that's interesting. Oh, it was funny. It was, yeah, it was really cool. I liked this guy. I didn't finish it. Huh, nobody's finishing it. Okay, specials are too long. So I decided to take this hour special that I had, cut it down to 15 minutes, and put it out on YouTube. All right? I, we made this thing. I was really proud of it. I just wanted to get it out there in the world. Right? It, it, it stopped becoming an outcome-based endeavor and just became something that I was proud of and wanted to share. Does that make sense? Okay, good. Even though you didn't respond. Uh, <laughs> So what we did is we put this little 15-minute special out, okay? And immediately that weekend, I sold out a bunch of shows in San Diego. And I was never a sellout guy. You know, I'd sell maybe a few tickets, but I never sold out, you know, the club. And I was like, maybe that's a coincidence. Maybe I got fan base in San Diego. And I kept doing different tour dates in different places, and more and more people came out. And I was like, wow, maybe there's something to giving away this material online. So I started putting out a clip every week on YouTube. I was going to do it for a year. Every week I put a new clip out on YouTube and these clips would start to go viral and they would blow up in places all around the world. India, Bulgaria, Romania, Russia, uh, you know, obviously America as well. Uh, and I would start to sell out these shows and it was crazy to see these people start to gravitate towards me. And my career kind of really blow up off of just putting out this material and I realized something. I decided to break it up into these small bits and create tons of different ports of entry to me as an entertainer, right? And by doing this, we saw this crazy effect happen on YouTube where a person would watch one video and then they would be watching for the next two hours, okay? So my problem initially was the business would not let me in and then the business itself had a problem where people would not watch their whole hour special and somehow I found a way where people would watch two hours of comedy in a row. And why was it? Is because it was two things. Authenticity and choice. I always felt like the best sleep I have every night is the nine minutes I get when I press snooze. <laughs> okay? I wake up, I'm exhausted, snooze, that nine minutes is like, ugh, I could have just did that. I didn't need the other <laughs> six hours, just let me snooze, right? I applied the snooze effect to stand up online. You watch a three minute clip, and then all of a sudden YouTube goes, you wanna watch another one? You go, snooze, I'll watch another one. <laughs> and just like when you sleep in, you end up snoozing for two hours. That's what you did with me, <laughs> okay? My career kind of explodes because of it. The other part, authenticity. I've always been drawn to, and we'll wrap this up right now, but I've always been drawn to Larry David, and I try to figure out why Larry David was this amazing character that breaks all cultural barriers. Anybody you meet that has experienced Larry David loves Larry David, right? He's not just old Jewish people's favorite comic. He's <laughs> young Puerto Rican's favorite comic too, right? Why? And it's because Larry David is an experiment in authenticity. It's what would it be like if you were your true self 24 hours a day, right? Hey, can I have a bite of your sandwich? 
No, why not? I don't like your mouth. <laughs> we all want to say that, but don't. So when we see somebody say it, we gravitate to that. And I think that what I always believed is I was going to do authentic material. I was going to do material that came from me. It hits you in your gut. I don't do material for how you want the world to be in stand-up. I do material for how we know the world is down here. And I realize that by putting it out there in the internet, right, and putting it out there on YouTube where there are billions of videos out there, somehow it was able to, t somehow it was able to touch people and people gravitate to it all around the world because you cannot deny your gut. And um, that is what I learned and that is what I share with you today that if you want success in whatever industry you are in, obviously find ways to hack it, but uh, by being truly authentic, you do not have to gravitate to the world. The world will gravitate to you. My name is Andrew Schultz. Have a lovely night. Okay, take care.